Now let's look at the competitive equilibrium in multiple labor markets. Here we got a northern labor market over here on the left, a labor northern labor market, and here we got a southern nor uh, labor market. Now this is uh, this actually occurred circa 1930. There were a lot of black workers from the south that moved to Chicago and New York City, and Back then, many of the labor unions barred people of color from joining their union. It was basically an all-white union, all-white male union. And when the black workers came from the South to, you know, fleeing the Jim Crow in the South, they were willing to work, black workers were willing to work for much less than the white union workers. So as a result, I think it was a Republican congressman from Long Island, and uh, many of his Democrat and Republican friends in the House and the Senate, they enacted the Davis-Bacon Act, which required uh, firms to pay a minimum wage, a union wage. And since blacks weren't allowed into the unions, it basically priced them out of the market. And the law, I believe, was called the Bacon-Davis Act or the Davis-Bacon Act, one or the other. So unions were able to crony up to the politicians in D.C. to impose this minimum wage that locked out black workers. Now, black workers, were, black workers in New York City were so upset with D.C. and FDR's New Deal that there were reports of uh, black workers in New York City, in Central Park, I believe it was, that were protesting the National Recovery Agency, the NRA, and they were calling it the Negro Runaround Act. So it's, it's quite fascinating. So this has happened in our past. It's also happening right now with workers coming from Mexico to America. They're working for less. So this model is, it, it uh, tells why uh, immigration of black workers into Chicago, into New York, and uh, workers from Mexico coming to America, it explains uh, what, what, what's going on. It's actually kind of cool. So initially the wage in the northern region exceeds the wage in the southern region. And that was the case circa 1930, right around, right before uh, the Davis-Bacon Act was enacted. It's also kind of the case right now. Wages in Mexico are really, really low. They're much higher in America. So what happens? Um, workers from low-wage areas move into areas with higher wages. And so what happens is the labor supply in the south falls. The labor supply in the north increases as workers migrate from low-wage markets to high-wage markets. And they'll continue to do this until the wages have equalized. Now, people in the North don't really like this, do they? The native workers or the northern workers that were making the higher wage don't like making a lower wage. But what everybody fails to understand is that when wages come down, it's just a short-run fix. It's just a short-run problem. I don't care about the short run. I care about the long run. But politicians care about the short run, whether they be Republican or Democrat. And what every fails to, uh, what every, uh, every, what every politician ends up doing is they make the short run mistake. They don't think long run. Maybe it's too hard to get across in a 15 second soundbite on the evening news. I don't know. Or maybe they're just pandering using populist policies. But what is going to happen when wages fall in the north? Well, marginal cost curves fall down. And we all know from firm theory, when a, a marginal cost curve falls in perfectly competitive markets, the supply curve increases. Because the marginal cost curve is a firm's supply curve in perfectly competitive markets. So when marginal cost falls, supply increases. Now, because supply is increasing, Output's going up. And if output's going up, then firms need more workers. Whether they be low-skilled, 
or high school. And so the labor demand curve is not going to stay right there. It's just not going to stay there. The companies in the northern uh, labor market are producing more. If they're producing more, they're buying more capital. And if they're producing more, they got to hire more high-skilled workers, more medium-skilled workers, and more low-skilled workers. So this demand curve is going to move to the right. And how far it moves probably depends on how much output goes up. If output goes up a lot, like it does over the long run, then this demand shift will be very large. And it might not even end up lowering the wages of the northern workers. Meanwhile, the people in the south are much better off. They're not living in poverty anymore. And isn't that what we want? Isn't that what we want? We want a world where people living in poor areas aren't poor anymore? Hmm. So the wages equalize across. The moral of the story is if demand remains where it's at, if demand remains where it's at, labor demand, which probably not going to happen, if demand remains where it's at, then the wages equalize across these two labor markets. Now here's a scatter plot of the percent annual wage growth versus the manufacturing wage in 1950. Okay, and you can see that Mississippi had a very low 1950 manufacturing wage. But it had a very large growth rate in its wages. Whereas Oregon began uh, this time period under, uh, under study by Katz and Blanchard, Oregon started out with a very high wage, just like Ohio did. So o Oregon has a very low percent change in its wages. So wages are growing very slowly in Oregon relative to Mississippi and Georgia. Okay, so what we want to do is we want to fit a regression line to this scatter plot. This simple regression line suggests there's a negative relationship between the growth rate in wages, the annual growth rate in wages, and the manufacturing wage at the start of the study in this particular paper. So if the average wage in a state is a dollar and five cents, according to this line we expect the wage to grow in that state by five and a half percent. Now why is it? Why are wages growing so rapidly in a low wage state? Well it goes back to our theory, right? Remember when there's a big wage differential a low wage state is going to catch up to the high wage state. So that's why the wages are growing so much for a state with very low starting wages in 1950. For a high wage state, maybe the average wage in the state is $1.85, according to this reg regression line, wages are going to grow much slower. So the difference, the difference in these two growth rates is because people might be leaving a low wage state which reduces the labor supply which drives up the wage and there are other factors working here too right this isn't the only factor so the slope of this line is found by what the rise in this line moving from 4.7 to 5.5 the rise is 5.5 minus 4.7. The run is 1.85 to 1.05. So the slope is minus 1. The annual growth rate in wages is 1 percentage point lower in states that have an average manufacturing wage in 1950 that is $1 higher than the average. Now let's look at immigration a little bit more in more depth. If 50 million immigrants cross the border to work and they and native workers are perfect substitutes, meaning we're talking about maybe low skilled workers, the labor supply increases by 50 million workers. So the labor supply curve moves to the right 
horizontally by 50 million. Now this has an immediate impact on the wage in low skilled labor markets. The wage drops from $10 an hour to $7 an hour. And everybody talks about how bad this is. But again, everybody's trapped in the short run. We're ignoring the next step, the step after that, and the step after that. Okay, so for native workers, remember there are 80 million native workers working at $10 an hour. When the wage falls to $7, the native workers whose reservation wage is 10 leave this market. Native workers whose reservation wage is nine leave this market. Native workers whose reservation wage is eight leave this market. Therefore, only those native workers whose reservation wage is seven or less will remain in the labor market. So 20 million native workers stop working in this labor market. So the difference between 110 and 60, again, is 50 million. And these workers moved, say, up from Mexico. $7 an hour is a lot better than what they're making in Mexico. I think the minimum wage in Mexico equates to about a dollar an hour. So the people that came from Mexico all have reservation wages below seven. So they're all working for seven. Immigration increases overall employment, but decreases W. But that's only a short-run uh, effect. Immigration decreases the number of native workers from 80 to 60, like I said. Immigration initially shifted out that supply curve, which raised E, but lowered W, right? Over time, capital expands as the firms take advantage of the cheaper labor. Remember, a lower wage means what? Marginal cost curves fall. Firm supply curves increase. A falling marginal cost curve is an increase in a firm's supply curve in a perfectly competitive output market. So if they're producing more, remember in a perfectly competitive market, firms can produce as much as they want at the market price. So if, the market, if we hold the market price constant, and market costs fall, supply increases, output's going to go up. If output's going up, firms are going to need more capital, they're, and they're going to need more workers to work that capital. So their labor demand is going to go up. How, go, how much it goes up, you know, that's the question. It may go up a little, it may go up a lot. The longer the time horizon, the more it'll probably shift out, holding everything else constant. In this diagram, the, de the labor demand curve shifts just enough where native workers aren't affected at all by the immigration. In the meantime, the labor supply in the poor country, say Mexico, the labor supply curve is a lot lower and people's wages in Mexico are a lot higher. And th there will be no more immigration from Mexico once the wages get approximately equal to the same. So the 20 million native workers re-enter the labor market at the higher wage. Now, while they are out of the labor market, maybe these 20 million workers, uh, they go back to school. And they, they get job skills that allow them to get a job in a medium-skilled labor market or a high-skilled labor market. Let's investigate the situation in which immigrants and native workers are perfect complements. If immigrants maybe workers from Mexico, and natives, maybe workers in America, American workers, who have bachelor's degrees, PhDs, master's degrees, are production complements, they don't compete in the same labor market. More immigration lowers the immigrant wage, increasing production because immigrant employment increases. Increased production shifts native labor demand out, increasing native wage and employment. Now, why is that? Well, remember, when wages fall in the lowest skilled labor market, the immigrant labor market, when wages fall in the lowest skilled market, which is comprised of immigrants, firms' marginal cost curves fall, 
which means their individual supply curves increase. They can sell all they want in the perfectly competitive output market at the equilibrium price. So they expand their production operations. They increase Q, which means they need more workers. So their demand for native workers increases because they're hiring more low-skilled workers. They need more high-skilled workers who happen to be natives. This raises native workers' wages. So immigration is great for people with master's degrees, bachelor's degrees, and PhDs. And now we have the 10-year change in log weekly wages First, the 10 year change in immigrant share. And what the scatter plot is suggesting is that, say, the change in a state's immigrant share. Well, for example, in a state that adopts a law that requires citizenship in order to get a driver's license, that might encourage undocumented workers from Mexico. To leave the state. So a state that adopts such a policy would be basically pushing immigrants out of the state. So they would see a fall in the share of their population that happens to be an immigrant. Now suppose it falls by 0.075. What does that do to wages? Now when you're looking at a change in log wages, as like a percent change. But for very small changes in wages, we can interpret the change in log weekly wages as a percent change in wages. So what this is saying is, is when a state is losing low skilled, most of them are probably low skilled, I'm not saying all are low skilled, but a state is probably losing many immigrants relative to its population which means what? In the low skilled labor market. When, when immigrants are leaving the state's labor market, that means labor supply is falling in that state. And when labor supply is falling in that state, wages rise. And that's exactly what this point is telling us. So a state that maybe draws immigrants in, because maybe it uh, allows pers a person with an address an electric bill to get a driver's license. Maybe that kind of state draws in undocumented workers from Mexico. So a state maybe like California that has probably more liberal policies with regards to driver's license is going to see its share of immigrant population grow. And so if the immigrant population grows by 17.5% here, then what's going to happen to the growth rate in that state's wages. Well, they're going to fall. Because what happens, it's drawing in more low-skilled immigrant workers from Mexico. Labor supply is increasing. And that's pulling down the wage. So th this data here and this regression trend line is predicting the theory that we presented in the previous slide. Now let's examine immigration and its effect on efficiency. And we're going to do that by looking at immigration surplus. Prior to immigration, there are N native workers in the economy, and national income is given by the blue trapezoid. In order to assume that the blue trapezoid represents national income, we have to assume that the firms, all firms, labor demand curve is its aggregate labor demand curve. And then maybe the first worker hired, the firms are paying a wage of A. The second worker hired is being paid a wage slightly lower than A. So we're going we're gonna to kind of think of this whole thing as the net wage bill in the entire economy. So this represents national income. Now immigration increases the labor supply curve to N plus I. N being the number of native workers, I being the number of immigrant workers. If all I immigrant workers are identical and they all have the same reservation wage, then they're all going to be paid W1. So the lower part of this pink trapezoid is the wage that goes to the immigrant workers. 
So, immigrants are paid a total salary given by this pink rectangle. The upper pink triangle is the immigration surplus. This represents the increase in national income that accrues to natives. So immigration makes native workers this much better off. It makes immigrant workers this much better off because the immigrant workers came from, say, Mexico. And in Mexico, maybe what they're making was a, a rectangle this big. So this policy makes immigrant workers better off. Hence, this policy of immigration is pretty efficient because immigrant workers are made better off and native workers are made better off. Now let's examine how a perfectly discriminating monopsonist steals worker surplus. Firms in a competitive market hire a total of E star employees at wage W star which maximizes the firm's profits. So <clears throat> the, the last worker hired number E star sets the wage. Why is that? Well, let's look at the firm surplus here. Now, this firm would be willing to pay this wage to the first worker hired, but only has to pay this wage. So the firm's like, wow, I'm getting a good deal here. I'd be willing to pay this, but I only have to pay that. Now, firms don't want workers to know that. That's why in the NFL and the NBA, all the owners talk about how they're always losing money, right? You hear that a lot. They're trying to hide how much they're willing to pay players. So firms don't want players to know the most, there will be, the most they'd be willing to pay for a given level of scarcity in the labor market. So if you get to the last worker hired, the last worker hired's reservation wage is W star, right? And they're the last worker hired. So the firm literally observes that last worker's the E star workers reservation wage. And the firm is only willing to pay W star. So the last worker gets paid W star, which is the most the firm would be willing to pay for that last worker. So this, this pink triangle represents firm surplus. Now what about the gray triangle? Now down here, the first worker hired be willing to work for $4 an hour. But it's getting paid 15 bucks an hour. And that person's going, man, I'd do this job for $3 an hour, but I'm getting paid for 15. Boy, this is great. So that worker has a lot of surplus. But if you look at the, the last worker hired, number E star, this worker's like, well, I'm indifferent between working or not at W star, so I guess I'll work. And so this great triangle is worker surplus. The perfectly discriminating monopsonist hires the same number of workers as a competitive market, but each worker gets paid his reservation wage. So what the firm has to have is really good information on workers' reservation wages. So, for example, if the firm knows the reservation wage of worker number 30, and all workers between 30 and E star, then the firm can take those workers' surplus. Now, the 30th worker is getting paid his or her reservation wage, even though the firm would be willing to pay a wage as high as this wage to that 30th worker. For the 10th worker, the firm knows the 10th worker's wage and pays the 10th worker hired W10. Even though the firm would be willing to pay up to that value. And then the first worker hired gets paid W1. So the firm will estimate this labor supply curve and try to take all the surplus. So a perfectly, perfectly discriminating monopsonist steals worker surplus. Now, I don't think very many workers have to worry about this because if this is going on at a factory, what do workers do? They'll talk about what wages they are getting paid. 
and then workers will be upset and so what the firms end up doing is just end up paying everybody the same wage however at private universities the university may be engaging in a kind of form of this um, at a state university all salaries of professors are known you can look them up on the internet but a private university that information is not available they don't make it publicly available so maybe the case that people in the department are being paid vastly different salaries and nobody would really know now let's examine a situation that arises in like a one factory town where you have a perfectly non-discriminating monopsonist a non-discriminating monopsonist pays the same wage to all workers and has estimated the labor supply equation. That's why they can kind of get away with this. Let's assume that the non-discriminating monopsonist has estimated the labor supply curve, maybe using regression analysis, and maybe this is what they came up with. W hat equal 5 plus 2E. Hence, the monopsonist kind of knows the lowest wage workers are willing to accept to work at a, the factory in this one factory town. <laughs> now, let me, uh, if we multiply the wage that the firm pays, whatever that happens to be, times the number of employees it decides to hire, then we can compute the total wage bill or the total cost of employment to this firm. Now, what I did here is I substituted in what W equaled. W was estimated to be 5 plus 2E. So we plug 5 plus 2e into this equation. We replace in w with what it equals. Use the distributive property, and now we have the total wage bill being 5e plus 2e squared. So the marginal cost or the marginal expense of employment equals the derivative of the total wage bill. Now, The coefficient of E is 1, so 1 minus 1 is 0, and then we multiply by the old exponent, which is 1. So 1 times 5 is 5. Over here we have an exponent of 2, and 2 minus 1 is 1. We multiply by the old exponent of 2, and we get 5 e to the 0 plus 4 to the 1. So here's a little rule of thumb. If the labor supply curve is a line, like it is here, the marginal cost of hiring the last worker is 5 plus 4E. Notice they have the same intercept, but the marginal expense or the marginal cost equation has twice the slope. So if you don't remember the calculus, just remember that rule of thumb. Okay, so there is the marginal cost of hiring the ETH worker, or the last worker. Profit maximization occurs where the marginal cost of hiring equals the value of marginal product. And we can solve these two, right? If we have the value of marginal product equation, and the firm knows that, the firm knows that better than the firm knows this. So all the firm has to do is set this equation equal to that equation right here. So even though the monopsonist is willing to pay a wage equal to the value of marginal product, this is the most it's willing to pay for that level of employment, it will only pay workers WM because it knows that the EM worker has a reservation wage equal to this level. Now let's study how a labor market represented by a union will negotiate for its members' wages. Since the union has a pretty good idea of how much firms value laborers, it can estimate the value of marginal product of the firms. And maybe it runs, it has historical data on the, union, or the, the firm, it runs a regression and it comes up with this equation, the value of marginal product equal to 25 minus 3 times e. Now this is just a regression estimate. Given this estimated equation, the union understands that the firm's labor demand equation is w equal 25 minus 3, where the right hand side is the value of marginal product.
Since the labor union sells laborers to firms, total earnings of its members can be thought of as the union's revenue. We'll call it RU. RU is just the wage times the number of employees. Now we're going to replace W with what it equals. It equals 25 minus 3E. So this is kind of similar to what we did in the previous slide. We use the distributive property. We differentiate with respect to E. And we get the marginal revenue product of labor equal to 25 minus 6E. Notice that the marginal revenue product curve has the same intercept as the labor demand equation, but has a slope that's twice as large. That's what we found in the previous model. Okay, then we graph the marginal revenue product curve. I notice it has the same intercept, but it's twice as steep as the value of marginal product curve. At this level of employment, EM, the reservation wage of the EM worker is equal to this value. So all these workers here would be more than willing to work for this wage. The firm would be willing to pay that much for the wage, uh, for the labor, for the EMF worker. So that's exactly what the labor union does. The monopolist restricts the number of laborers, it allows to become members, so it can negotiate up to the value of marginal product curve. And it negotiates that wage equal to WM. Now, if the labor union knows this equation, and we're assuming it does, maybe it estimated with historical data, then once it knows this value, you can plug in this value to that equation. Well, how does it get this value? Well, it knows this equation from here, and it obviously knows its own labor supply curve. So all it does is solves those two equations simultaneously and then plugs in the solution to that system of equations into the value margin product curve to get the wage that it's going to ask for. So you can think of it this way. This is the lowest wage that maybe the firm's going to offer, and this is the highest wage that maybe the union's going to offer. Or, so this is going to be the high ball from the union, and this is going to be their low ball number.